Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. White people in Appalachia start an NAACP chapter to fight for social justice. This week on the Laura Flanders Show, that and other surprising stories from Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II, architect of North Carolina's Moral Monday movement. All that and we visit with protesting workers from one of Donald Trump's casinos and I'll share a few words on bullies on TV. It's not a bias problem, it's a power problem. Welcome to The Laura Flanders Show, where people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. We're going to talk next about profits of the money sort, profits of the social sort, and prophecy, and what's happened to the prophetic tradition. And there is literally no one better suited to talk about this in the United States right now than our guest. He is Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, the architect of the Moral Movement, Moral Monday Movement, coming out of North Carolina. Reverend Barber, welcome to the program. Glad to be here with you. So let's talk about the money profit mm -hmm. sort for the moment. What is the role that profit is playing in our society these days? Well, when we think about we're in the wealthiest nation and the poorest nation at the same time, and that the profit, P-R-O-F-I-T, is driving our decisions in a very immoral way. In my scriptures that I study, the greatest sin in, 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 in religious texts is idolatry, self-worship, which always then leads to a profit motive uh, agenda, which then leads to the oppression of people. In many ways, the Moral Monday movement came as a reaction to some of that. You want to fill yeah. our audience in a little bit? The Moral Monday movement started in April of 2013 uh, with a series of civil disobedience in our state legislature in North Carolina. But it was re in reaction to a veto-proof majority of extremists who called themselves Republicans were elected and a governor who said he was a moderate but really was a Tea Party extremist. And in the first 50 days, they t attacked the working poor, cut a billion dollars from public education to take that money and go, go to private schools, attack women, they attacked the LGBT community, they refused health care. It was almost as though they had what I call ext extreme regressivism on steroids. <laughs> and then in March of 2013, they decided to go after the one place that kind of evens the scales, and that's the ballot box. Yeah and they chose to pass the worst voter suppression laws or begin the process for doing it the same week that we were remembering Bloody Sunday. Yeah. And so we decided from a faith perspective, Jews, Muslims, Christians, that if they were gonna crucify the poor and crucify the sick and crucify the LGBT community and crucify health care and force hospitals to close and then crucify voting rights, every crucifixion needed a witness needed a challenge to it, and that we had to do that. So 17 people went in, they arrested us for protest, prayer, and singing. They arrested a woman in a wheelchair who had cerebral palsy on state property. The next Monday people came, next, and by the end of the summer, nearly 1,000 people, and by the next February, mm -hmm. 80,000 people showed up in one day saying that we would not allow profit to dominate uh, our public square without a challenge. So we talk on this program often about how do we shift from a sense of individual, private, profit, money, profit mm -hmm. as a motivator to a sense of social profit. Mm -hmm. um, what has come from your mobilization in those terms? What would you use those terms? Well, what we have found is that when you are facing the idolatry of the profit motive uh, that, has, that, that spends an awful lot of time and money capturing the heart and the imagination there has to be a prophetic, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-I-C, move. And when you look at scriptural history, for instance, the prophets always arose when the money-driven false prophets were being the chaplains of the mm -hmm. state. The prophets would rise to be the conscience of the state. Mm -hmm. We found that by not talking about left and right or Democrat versus Republican, but talking about what are these programs morally defensible and are they economically uh, sane and are they constitutionally consistent, we have been able to create new metaphors. We, we talk about, for instance, um, in the book of Isaiah where it says, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights. 
we say to politicians, since you want to put your hand on the Bible and swear to be an author, we're going to make you read it. We talk about establishing justice has, is the only framework for whatever kind of economic systems we have. If it doesn't establish justice, it's not constitutional. Mm -hmm. We talk about uh, how, in, for instance, in the New Testament, Jesus says, woe unto the rich, woe. And, what, and then we show people, we put a face on the pain. A moral movement lifts up the people, it doesn't lift up individuals. So we, we might have a Republican and a Democrat on stage, both who have uh, relatives that are dying because they can't get Medicaid expansion. Or they can't pay their bills because they don't have living wages. And we put a face on it and we raise the consciousness. And I'm telling you, since we started, when we started, people said it wouldn't work. They said, mm. We've seen the moral consciousness of the state shift. Most of the issues when we started, we were polling under 50% in favor. Now they're well over 50%. Yeah. And, and we know that there's, a, that there's something about the heart of our democracy and that every progressive movement has had a deep moral center, whether it was the abolition movement, the New Deal, the, the war on poverty, the civil rights movement, they all had this deep moral prophetic core. We, you're talking about history. We've talked in the past about the history of Reconstruction mm -hmm. and some of the extraordinary gains mm -hmm. and successes mm -hmm. of the Reconstruction period, mm -hmm. whether you're talking political, economic, mm -hmm. um, black-run towns, black-run businesses. Mm -hmm. um, you've also talked about a vision that was put out in that period mm -hmm. that was pretty expansive, uh, not right-left, but pretty economically inclusive. It was, it is powerful. When you think about, for instance, in North Carolina in 1868, Samuel Ashley, a white Congregationalist minister, and J.W. Hood, a black AME Zion Frederick Douglass clergy, joined hands, went into the state legislature and said, we're gonna demand some things be put in a new constitution. First thing they said, we're gonna rewrite the preamble. And in 1868, they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all persons, not men, all persons are, 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 are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, the enjoyment of the fruit of their own labor. Because they knew it. work without the enjoyment of your labor is another form of slavery. In 1868, they guaranteed public education. We, we haven't done that in the federal constitution yet. So what happened to all that? Well, what happened was once they opened the society up, there's always been a reaction. And there was a reaction by the extremists of their day. They attacked the courts. They attacked uh, leaders. They attacked voting rights. Uh, and they, did, they, they engaged in a movement called the Redemption Movement. It sounds moral, but it was used for immoral purposes. Rede their, their redemption meant redeem the society from black and white moral fusion politics. And so through violence, through uh, abuse of the courts and denial of voting rights, they stopped the first reconstruction. Dr. King talked about wealth beyond conscience. Mm -hmm. You've talked about reaction taking often a violent form. Mm -hmm. How do you see the stories that we hear today about extreme policing? I want to mm -hmm. call it, an extreme violence mm -hmm. against um, black people, mostly mm -hmm. people who've been made poor, mm -hmm. uh, that has provoked the, moral, the uh, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, Matter which is a, a works with Moral Monday. You know, one of the things we're seeing is something we saw at, in the deconstruction of the first reconstruction and the deconstruction of the second reconstruction, and that is almost some persons feeling that there is a need and a necessity to, to annihilate black lives, uh, that it becomes okay. But we can't stop with police brutality. We have to look at policy. As I said, all of the states that denied Medicaid expansion, for instance, because they don't like a black man in the White House, that's the only reason they did it. I mean, it, it can't be economics because it would bring jobs. It can't be because it's going to cost people money. It can't be because it's going to people who don't work. Medicaid expansion goes to mostly working poor people and veterans, retired veterans. But 2,800 people die for every 500,000 people denied. And in the states that have denied it, six out of 10 black people live, even though more white people <laughs> actually would receive it. That's a form of violence. So are we doing an effective job in calling that out? Is the Democratic Party doing no. it? Do you see it happening? No, I think sometimes we are too locked in. I hear parties in left and right, uh, Republican versus Democrat, 
We need to really talk about some things that are morally wrong. We need to recapture it. We need to challenge the misuse of evangelicalism. Too often, I go in places and hear people saying, well, the evangelicals are supporting Trump. And I want to say, I'm an evangelical. I'm mm -hmm. not there. Mm -hmm. Or the conservative. I'm a conservative. They're, true conservatives would want to uh, push justice and, and righteousness. Somebody said, you can't read the Bible literally and not be a progressive. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we have to fight against is, is us believing their report, <laughs> the report of the other side, and listening and saying there's nothing. I remember when Marl Monday got started, folks said, well, there's nothing we can do. They won the election. There was so much despair. But then when we went in and challenged it, people began to say, no, we don't have to wait till another election cycle. We can fight back. We can stand up. And each Monday, more people came, and they began to see, we may not win right now, but we build a movement. And who's the we? Black and white and Native American and Latino and young and old and gay and straight and Republican and Democrat and independent and teachers and students and wealthy people who, with a conscience who are standing right beside poor people and labor work. We had one guy to come and said, I am a business owner for labor rights. That's why I'm here. We've seen, we've had Republicans and Democrats stand on the same stage from a moral perspective. People forget, with, even with the biblical prophets, not only did they challenge the system, not only did they announce the damage that would be caused if transformation didn't happen, they always finished with hope. Yeah. They always did what Walter Brueggemann called engaged in subversive hope. They always, like Dr. King, first 15 minutes, let me tell you about this nightmare in America. Let me tell you about this cat, a check that keeps coming back, more insufficient fund, but I still have a dream. Yeah. I still have, and, and that hope is subvert. Now it's dangerous. It might get you killed in a in a place where where the, the power structures that be cannot stand for people to be happy and protesting, hopeful and fighting. But it is key and it's critical. So there's the hope, and then there's the fighting. There's the fighting. You have a plan for this spring. You have an action plan. Right. We have actually in the book I wrote, we lay out 14 steps because I don't want anybody to think that it's somehow in inspirational but not pragmatic. It's both. We have to build these coalitions. We have to engage in voter registration, voter education, voter protection. We're now organizing 3,000 communities of faith uh, that will engage in massive voter education, voter protection, voter mobilization. We're On February the 13th, we're having a massive moral march, uh, a GOTV effort called This Is Our Selma, This Is Our Time, This Is Our Vote. We are organizing thousands of volunteers to work in 90 counties across North Carolina. We're, we're training hundreds of pastors and young adults in how to do moral analysis, moral articulation, and moral activism, and we're planning for the long term. We say it like this, prophetic um, voices and prophetic movements must be a movement and not a moment. Mm. Must be a movement and not a moment. Is it fun? Oh, yeah. You know, every day that I get up and, first of all, wake up with justice on my mind, I'm thankful. Wake up with the ability to fight. When I look out at my church when I pass, uh, on Sunday mornings and I see people there who need medicated, who need uh, education, who are great people, uh, who need their voting rights, it's a joy to go out and fight with them, not for them. When I hear a lady come and say, I drove six hours to this Marl Monday, I was so depressed. When I go to Mitchell County, that's 99% white, 89% Republican, and find people Republican and Democrats that are putting down those labels and picking up this moral vision. When I see 93-year-old Rosanelle Eaton, who's our lead plaintiff against the voter suppression, say to me, boy, they think I'm going to die before this court is over, but I'm not dying. I'm going to be right here with you. And she marches. When, one day when I saw her, a 90-year-old black woman and a 90-year-old white woman, join hand and lead 168 people into the legislature, and they all got arrested. Mm. And they all got arrested. When I see young people by droves joining together, not as an, as an afterthought, but in the center of the movement, when I look out and see a thousand clergy, Sikhs, Muslims, Christians, Jews, joining together, uh, when people come up to me and say, I was wrong, I, 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 I thought I was misguided, 
when a person comes up to me and says, I'm an atheist, and I'm not quite ready to change on my atheism, but you know what? I have found out at these rallies, part of my anger is not at, is at the God I was taught, not the God, that, yeah. not, not the God of justice and love and mercy. And when my children say, Daddy, thank you for, for, for being a part of a movement we can be a part of. And I see young people and old people holding hands together, not creating that false dichotomy. There's got to be youth or it's got to be elders, but coming together in this grand moral movement. And when I see moral Monday spread to 15 other states, when I talked to Jim Forbes, who told me the other day, I'm 80 years old, I got to come out of retirement. He says, I'm Moses, you're Joshua. Let's go do a national revival. Let's go build direct action around the country. And I said, yeah, Jim, let's do, let's do that. It is a joy to work for love and justice and mercy. And if I had to die, I'd rather die doing that and knowing that I left a, left a, leg left a legacy. Sometimes even the threats are joy, and I don't mean I like the threats, mm -hmm. but I know enough about history to know that if, when they write the negative stuff in the papers, if we weren't making a difference, they wouldn't be writing about us. Too right. I gotta ask you one last question for a lot of people in our audience, and for me too. Mm -hmm. One of the most joy-infused movements of our time, really the only way it's made the gains mm -hmm. that it has, um, one of the most love-based mm -hmm. movements of our time has been the LGBTQ oh, yeah. movement. Yeah. For a lot of us in that movement, when we hear moral, that's mm -hmm. the stick that's been used to beat us mm -hmm. with. Tell me I'd be comfortable in your rally. Because first of all, we unpack that. We will not allow people to use the Bible to beat up people and faith to beat up people. There are 2,000 scriptures in the Bible that I read that speak to love and justice. There are only about maybe two or three that give a little bit about homosexuality. Most of them are misinterpreted and none of them trump this one. You gotta love your neighbor as yourself. I remember when they started the marriage amendment in North Carolina and they thought that they were gonna grab the black community. And I was a part of bringing people together before the NAACP came out. They actually used what we did in North Carolina to, to come, I, I know because I wrote the, the, the um, the motion <laughs> at an NAACP national board meeting with Julian Bond. And we, we came out and we said, wait a minute, you're not gonna come in our community after you have fought us on everything and then tell us to be against the LGBT community. First of all, because the LGBT community is our community. Mm -hmm. Second of all, because if you undermine anybody's civil rights, you undermine everybody's civil rights. Number three, because we know love. We know a God of love who has made everybody. So it's a joy to me when I'm in a room, as I was the other day, and a, an LGBT um, student came up to me in tears and asked because she hugged me. And I said, why? She said, because most of the preachers I've ever met would not have anything to do with me. And we hugged and we embraced. Uh, my best friend, my sis, one of my best friends and my sister is, is Nancy Petty, who is an openly lesbian pastor of, of um, of um, um, a church in, uh, Pullman Memorial Church in Raleigh, uh, which has been historically on the side of voting rights and civil rights. We cannot allow this heresy to continue that suggests that the interests of faith and God is prayer in the schools, homosexuality, yeah. and, and uh, where you stand on the issue of abortion. That is not the faith that I know. The faith that I know of says the weightier matters have to do with love and justice and mercy. So we have to go right at that. We have to challenge it. Um, and, that's, and, and then we do something else in Mar Monday, last thing. Some days we flip the script on the media. So they'll come, and my good friend, Bishop Tanya Rawls, who's openly lesbian, gay, will get up and say, I'm here to talk about voting rights. And the media said, well, I thought she was a lesbian. And she said, and then we'll have somebody straight to get up and talk about LGBT rights. And the media said, why? We said, because we're letting you know once and for all, you will not separate us. You will not separate us anymore. Reverend Barber, we will follow your um, progress this year and with any luck, get our cameras there and continue to cover your progress. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. We'll come join you. That was Reverend Barber. Workers at Trump International Hotel in Las Vegas are fighting for a contract and better working conditions. Producer Jonathan Klett brought us this report. 
Trump's company has yet to sit down and recognize that union and bargain a first contract. He says he's a world famous negotiator. If he really wants to make America great again, he should start by negotiating with these workers, making a deal with them. We are here to talk to Mr. Donald Trump to get a negotiation with our contract for a union because we won an election on December 5th last year. So it was clean and we want him to respect that election. I live check by check and it's a really hard job for us, you know, to send my kids to school. Muy difícil, muy cansado. Como he tenido la oportunidad de trabajar en hoteles con sindicato. Es cuando tú tienes un un sindicato en tu trabajo tienes respeto, tienes ese beneficio. Puede ser mejor con representación de unión. We're not second class employees. We want the same treatment as the strip because we work the same job, the same title, and we're getting paid less and we got no respect inside the, the hotel. Soy sobreviviente de cáncer. Tengo muchos biles médicos que la aseguranza no puede pagar. Estamos aquí en su, en su casa, no nos dejó entrar, pero estamos esperando en que él nos llame para sentarnos en la mesa a negociar su contrato. I think everybody we are a little bit afraid, but we won the election. We won the election fair, square, and the federal government say so. I worked there as a housekeeper for seven years. My husband got laid off on construction, and it's a very hard job for me to do to support my kids, but this is a future for them. I would like to ask to say to Mr. Donald Trump, he wants to make America great again. He can start with us, the workers at Trump Las Vegas, to negotiate a contract as soon as possible. months, we have done our best here at the Laura Flanders Show to keep it a Trump-free zone. As far as humanly possible, we have not commented on Donald Trump's rise, his fall, his peaks, or his lows. But maybe, just maybe, there is something positive that could come of this Trump fiasco, and that's the creeping realization that media critics were right all along. Concentrated media power is real power, and we should worry about it. As James Madison once said, a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to farce or tragedy, perhaps both. Or to put it another way, years in office climbing the political ladder are no match for hosting 14 seasons on The Apprentice. Trump's success with real voters has put the GOP's gatekeepers in a snit. Media bias, they cried way, 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 way too late in the game. But Trump is far from the only dangerous bully puffing himself up on the public's airwaves. His 11 years on NBC isn't close to Bill O'Reilly's 20 years on Fox. Just like Trump, O'Reilly's never seen a civil rights violation he couldn't blame on a civil rights victim or a goat he couldn't scape. But who cares? Only ratings matter in this game. O'Reilly's bosses didn't even blink when he who spends much of his time ranting about derelict parenting by black parents lost custody of his kids after his daughter told a court she'd witnessed him drag her mother down a staircase by the neck. Only ratings matter. These are the public's airwaves and these are the people in whose hands we leave them. It's not a bias problem, it's a power problem. And it's exactly what happens when we let markets, not sense, rule. To tell me what you think, write to me, laura at lauraflanders.com.